think we've been renewed, Jeff. Uh, we're back for episode two. Wow, this is so exciting. It's incredible we got a second episode. <laughs> and they said it would never last. Yeah, really. I mean, those naysayers, them guys, <laughs> whoever they were. Hey, I, I don't know about you, Jeff, but the buzz and the encouraging notes and, and just the awesome feedback I've received has been absolutely wonderful for this podcast. And are you getting the love as well? <laughs> yes. I heard from people that I've kind of not forgotten, but sort of, you know, on the surface forgotten. And so it's amazing to hear from people that you, you know, that you don't see or talk about every day. And suddenly there they are saying very nice things about you and to you. So that's been very, very gratifying. I thank you all for for showing up and for doing that. I'm sure some people that I don't want to <laughs> have show up may, um, but that's okay too. The good news is is that podcasting brings absolutely no money in. So it's not like people are going to be coming out of the woodwork asking for a loan. At least you have that. So you didn't get the check? I got my check. I'm sure. Ooh. Well, never mind. Well, anyway. You got paid? Moving right along. Well, we'll discuss this uh, away from the microphone. Um, but uh, we're going to start this episode off with some mash news. My nose for news thinks it smells a story here. Here it comes. Okay. Uh, all right. We're matched into Armed Forces Radio for a special broadcast. It sounds big, folks. Really? Ooh. Oh, well, that's news to me. It happened on September 6th, the sad news that writer and producer Thad Mumford had passed away at the age of 67. Mm -hmm. Thad Mumford is a name that, of course, MASH fans would probably be very familiar with because I see it in the opening credits of many episodes that he and his partner Dan Wilcox wrote, but I didn't know much about him until he passed away. And then I really got into reading up on him and, and learning his story. And my goodness, what an interesting career he had. Mm -hmm. For one, and this is kind of nice, I did not realize that that he was African-American. He was what? I, <laughs> what? I didn't know if you knew this or not, Jeff, but yeah, he was African-American. And, mm. and in a time when most writing rooms in Hollywood... Uh, were pure blinding white. He kind of broke through and was able to write for not just MASH, but a long list of great shows. And I'll run down a list of some of those shows here in a moment. But, um, Jeff, I just want to kind of toss it to you and, and ask, uh, what were your memories of Thad Mumford? Well, uh, you know, in my particular situation, I will be very honest. Um, and, uh, transparent. Uh, obviously, Private Igor was not uh, one of the main characters. I wasn't Hawkeye. Uh, so I had less direct contact with most of the writers than folks like uh, Alan Alda did, uh, though I had some relationships with them. I was not, uh, you know, directly involved in some of the creative uh, issues that went on with MASH that some of the other folks were. So I didn't have a strong connection with any of the writers. Funny, other than Larry Gelbart. Larry was on the set a lot, and I, I, I was able to establish a friendship with him, and he's a wonderful guy. He was an incredible human being, incredible genius, and a wonderful person at the same time. I did have fleeting moments with Thad Mumford and Dan Wilcox. Uh, interestingly enough, I now have a kind of a renewed relationship with Dan for various reasons, and strangely enough, uh, after many, many years of working on the show and many years after the show ended, I was contacted by Loretta Sweat, and she suggested that Thad Mumford wanted to speak with me. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. So uh, she said, here's his telephone number. He'd like you to call him, which I did. And we had a very nice, very warm, fun, pleasant conversation. He was a very funny guy. Uh, a lot, some writers aren't. Uh, particularly funny uh, other than when they write it down, but he was. He had a great performance kind of uh, side to him. Uh, he used to be an actor, so uh, he he was really a fun guy to talk to, a very, very colorful kind of fellow to speak with. So that was a very ex a wonderful experience after all those years to kind of renew a friendship with him, which made uh, the shock of his passing, which was literally about five days later, uh, even more significant. I, I was really stunned. I kept 
you know, I, I, somebody sent me an email, told me, and I was really out of my mind. I couldn't believe it. I said, wait a minute. I would just talk to him. He was fine. We had a great time. He was laughing and having a good time. So it was quite a shock. And I've just, I, I was actually uh, contacted by Dan saying that Dan is trying to set up kind of a memorial for him in, a, in the next couple of weeks, uh, which hopefully everybody will, or at least everybody who's in town will be able to attend. Uh, he was a favorite guy. People loved him. A uh, very interesting fellow, and as you say, had a great, interesting background, and uh, just, you know, a, a really great guy. It, it's hard to lose people, uh, and I think I said this in an email to you, that uh, it's, you know, when you're working on a television show that has the longevity that MASH did, you become a family. The good part of the family and the bad part of the family, but you become a family and very attached to everybody. So losing people like we kind of are, now, because time marches on and it happens, is is kind of stunning and is kind of painful. So, unfortunately, that's kind of the uh, atmosphere of where our, the MASH family is right now because of this kind of suffering and feeling that loss. Yeah. Hey, isn't this a fun podcast? <laughs> And now the funny stuff. Well, I just want to briefly touch on a few things about Thad Mumford that I found fascinating. One, I knew that he was a big baseball fan, lifelong Yankees fan. He was actually one of the ball boys for the Yankees when he was younger. His writing career, I read this in, in one of the stories, that it actually began when he was an NBC page. And he worked at the studios around The Tonight Show. And he pestered, basically pestered to death the head writer of The Tonight Show to pitch some jokes to Johnny Carson. And eventually the head writer did, and Johnny used some of them, which I can't imagine th that feeling. Eventually, Thad Mumford became a regular contributor to uh, Johnny Carson, The Tonight Show, which just absolutely blows my mind. Yeah, He went on to write, uh, here's just a few of the shows he wrote for. Good Times, Maud, What's Happening, Roots, The Next Generations, Alice, The Cosby Show, Alf, A Different World, Coach, Home Improvement, NYPD Blue, The Electric Company, Blue's Clues, and Sesame Street. So that is just uh, just a few of the shows that he wrote for Thad Mumford. And from MASH perspective, these are the episodes that he and Dan Wilcox wrote. The first episode they wrote together was Are You Now Margaret?, then Nurse Doctor, Captain's Outrageous, Bottle Fatigue, Goodbye Cruel World, Back Pay, Death Takes a Holiday. Uh, one of my all-time favorite episodes, A War for All Seasons. Where's the corn? You're looking at it. The mushy stuff. You, you creamed it. You, you, Lily. I'm just trying to be helpful. Next 4th of July, you can eat it on the cob for all I care. Also, depressing news, bless you, Hawkeye, identity crisis, wheelers and dealers, heroes, bombshells, settling debts. Uh, the penultimate episode, as time goes by, which was actually the last episode that was filmed. And then he was one of the many writers who helped to write the, uh, the finale, Goodbye, Farewell, and Amen. So what a great career and thoughts and prayers go out to the entire MASH family and to Thad's family as well. Thank you. Absolutely. And, and you know, he did write, uh, as you said, he wrote, Are You Now, Margaret, that episode, which I believe they won uh, the Writers Guild Award for in 1980. But it's interesting that that show uh, is very, very timely. And I don't want to go on to the whole story about the show, but anybody uh, who has everything on tape or on a DVD uh, should look at Are You Now, Margaret, because it is a it, it relates <laughs> quite interestingly to what is going on in 2018. <laughs> yes, it was then centered around uh, Senator McCarthy and his uh, his witch hunt. Yes. And now, uh, as they say, everything old is new again. Yep, sure is. Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately. Uh, there, by the way, there is a great interview with Thad Mumford online with the uh, uh, Archive of American Television. I will include the link in the show notes uh, that you can find at mashmatterspodcast.com. But one of the, the things in the interview, the interviewer asks him, how do you want to be remembered? And he said, I'd like to be remembered as somebody who, who did good work and work that has, is lasting and meaningful. Wow. And he did just that. Yeah, he won, didn't he? Yes, he did. He did. Yes, he did. 
I, and I know that Dan, Dan and he were very, very close and uh, was very uh, helpful to him uh, when he did have some health issues in the past. So uh, he's he's really pretty, he's taking it pretty hard. So I, I send all my good wishes to Dan Wilcox as well. Absolutely. All right. Well, uh, there's no easy way to transition from that into, you know, uh, jocularity, jocularity. So, um, well, I'm removing my pants. I just think that helps a little bit. It's a segue. It's a segue physically, emotionally. But officer, it's a segue. It's a segue. Um, yeah. <laughs> So, what you ride? Is that a thing? You is it Segway or Segway? What 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 is that thing? Is it Segway? It's a Segway. Yeah, you can you can ride the Segway, but they prefer that you wear pants while you're riding on the Segway. Why are you riding? Yeah, otherwise you skin things that are not good to skin. <laughs> That's right. So we uh, put the call out for people to email us any questions or comments they had, and we have. I believe it or not, Jeff. People are actually listening to this podcast. Hey, mail call! Yes, 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 I'll write you a long letter. Right away! You got a letter written in mumble. Search it, everybody. I've got a whole bunch of letters here, and they're all on stationery from the Pierre Hotel. Hey, hey, hey. I have them right here. Man, email is noisy. I'm going to say the names, just some of the names, because I, th- I think people like to hear their names. So it, before we get into the questions, we'll get into them individually. But we heard... Wonderful things from Steve Bennett, Chris Kennedy, Lisa Fetzko, Jason Snyder, Nicole and Russ, who didn't want to give their last names. I don't blame them. And (laughs) Travis Cook. And, oh, that's all. I mean, so far. Uh, Yeah. But so thank you, all those people. That's really nice of you to have shown up and and done that. I hope you, you know, hear your names and, and send more. Absolutely. We want to hear from you. So you can uh, hop on the website, which is mashmatterspodcast.com. Uh, you'll find the email address on there. You'll also find a phone number where you can leave us a voicemail. We don't have any voicemails yet, but I'm, I'm still waiting for that first voicemail to come in. Uh, you can do that by calling 513-436-4077. So uh, we were going to take a few of these questions. Uh, we're going to save a few of these questions for some other episodes, too. But we wanted to go ahead and, and tackle some of these. The first is from Chris Kennedy, and uh, he says, Guys, I love the idea of this podcast, and I love MASH. One question I have has to do with the one-line jokes, whether in the middle of a show or in the last scene, some of the actors' reactions, like laughter. (laughs) Wait, Wait, I thought I turned the laugh track off on this. Hold on one moment. So some of the reaction to the other actors' lines or jokes look like it's the first time they're hearing it. For example, Hawkeye... Uh, did he know that the soot would come out of the pole in the swamp and get all over Henry's face? If he or they did, then it shows the skill of the performance. So I guess he's asking, hmm. were these ad libs, were these lines that were just thrown in to get genuine reactions, or were they just really scripted and amazing actors? Chris, don't ever write us again, please. That's one of the <laughs> stupidest questions I've ever heard. Next. <laughs> no, no. Okay, I'm sorry. Chris. Let's, let's, I will reveal the truth. And I've had a similar question before, not to diminish the, the power of your question, Chris, but people have said, oh gosh, did you guys ad lib? And the answer is absolutely positively no. Nobody on that show ever ad libbed while they were shooting anything. There were table reads where everybody sat around the table and read the script, which was the first time that they'd seen the script and were able to read it, Mm -hmm. talking with all all the other actors. And in those times, at that moment, somebody might say, well, gee, could I say duck instead of mallard? And then the writers would huddle and go, I don't know, can you say duck instead of mallard? I don't know. I'll say mallard or duck. What's funny? I don't know. I'm not sure. And then they would make a decision, and that would be it. So from that point on... Duck was in, Mallard was out, and nobody ever questioned that again. And especially when you're shooting something, um, nobody can start playing around and ad-libbing. When you're on a movie and you have kind of unlimited budgets and you can spend lots of and shoot lots of film and spend lots of times with the crew just eating up billions of dollars a uh, a minute, you could probably do that. And there are actors and there are, are directors who allow that to happen. But on MASH, where it was written by incredibly brilliant, talented writers, 
Uh, they wrote those words for specific reasons, and it was incumbent uh, on the actor and their responsibility to stay true to those words no matter what. So, no, those things were not surprises. He knew that was going to happen. Uh, it is a tribute and a talent, like you say um, very nicely, Chris, about um, it shows the skill of the performance it was. People who react that way uh, are highly trained people and very talented, and they can react that way 52 times if they have to. So, nope, it's, uh, he knew it was going to happen, and it was just their talent, and nobody ad-libs. Unlike what we do. <laughs> <laughs> right. We are completely unscripted, and I think it shows. <laughs> we are Ed and Lib. Together, we're having a great time. Now, I have to ask, though, in your opinion, which is funnier, Duck or Mallard? I, you know, let me huddle with a ride. Guys, what do you think? Oh, oh, duck, I, oh, oh. We'll get back to you on that. Okay. All right. So next, uh, Lisa Fetzko, she actually sent us quite a few questions and, uh, she apologized for sending them. And I said, absolutely don't apologize. Thank you. We, we really appreciate it. I don't know that we're going to answer all of them, but one of the questions she asks is about, uh, the, the actors who did the voice of the PA announcers. And there were actually two. There was Sal Viscuso and Todd Sussman. She said, did the cast actually know those guys? Or were they also on set as extras? Or was all of their work done in a recording studio in a separate location from the cast? Now, she does point out that Todd Sussman did play a soldier who had the nose job. The, the question is, did the cast know those guys? Were they around on set or did they do their stuff away from the set? Lisa, thank you for that question. It's very interesting, but it is none of your business. So let's move on. <laughs> I mean, really, I mean, this is. This is too personal. Well, you know, I can just imagine after hearing these answers that new questions are just going to start flooding in. <laughs> all right, I'll answer the question. Okay, first of all, I have to say Todd Sussman and I knew each other. Todd was a uh, terrific actor. I think he still is a terrific actor. Uh, he and I would run in, into each other on commercial auditions because I did a bunch of commercials as well. And we were kind of the same type sort of looking kind of people. You mean dazzlingly handsome? Yes. Uh, both of us were. Uh, and so did everybody know them? Uh, no, because usually those things were done in a sound stage. Uh, the recording for the, the, uh, the PA announcements were not done on the stage. So they would just have call Sal in or Todd in and say, here, uh, you know, you're sitting in kind of a sound booth and here's a script. Read that and thank you very much and get a donut and get out of here. So that's what they did. Now, Todd did play that role. I think Sal also played something in some show, which I don't know, but I think he was. He did. He was the soldier who actually told Father Mulcahy the location of the um, the, the stolen penicillin that the black marketers had stolen. So that was, MASH fans will know which episode I'm talking about. But yeah, so he was actually on screen too. Both of them made on-screen appearances as well as their voices. You heard just about every episode uh, throughout the entire series. Very nice guy. I did not know Sal Viscuso very well at all, but I did know Todd. And he's, a, he's a good guy, still is, I hope. Lisa also asked two questions. One actually kind of goes back to that sound booth uh, kind of thing that we just talked about. But uh, she said when the, let's see, about the scene, Radar plays the bugle and Frank orders Igor to fire the salute. And then Igor says, look, sir, the angle. <laughs> was that? I said that so well. <laughs> Since it's boy, 12 years in acting school. But sir, the angle. Uh, $30,000. <laughs> so the question is, did Gary Berghoff really play the bugle in that sound the scene or was it a sound effect added later uh he did you know here's an interesting answer i'm not sure i don't remember i doubt very much that the bugle sound that you heard was played live i think that was added afterwards like um the pa announcements because they'd have to do that. Mm -hmm. But I think he may have blown the thing to make a noise so we could all kind of look at it and react to it. So he probably made the, the going, <laughs> but that wasn't exactly what you heard. The only thing that would cause me to think that maybe he did play it is that it was kind of well known that Radar was not a talented bugler by any means. So yeah. if uh, if he was actually playing it maybe it wasn't being done very well so e either either way he was blowing and there was noise coming out of the, the bugle probably yeah I, I i don't remember this was 300 years ago but i i think he may have made the noise 
if they wanted him to actually uh, make the sound with that funny bugle, they probably recorded it separately, not with in the context of that scene, because it's just too hard in terms of technically to record it while he's standing there and all this other stuff is happening. So very possibly they shot the scene, he made the funny noise, but then they went back and said, okay, uh, Gary, blow into the mic now, and he made it, and then they recorded that. Maybe that's the sound they used. I don't really know, gotcha. but I doubt very much that the master scene that you saw with him blowing the thing is is the noise that he was actually making. And then the other question, she says, was the ping of whatever that was supposedly hit the bugle something physically <laughs> thrown at it, or was that a sound effect? No, Lisa, nobody threw things or punished any of the actors very <laughs> severely. So, no, that ping was a sound effect. That that wasn't actually a, a bullet or anything else. So you were not instructed in reality to shoot Gary Berghoff? I was not, no. Okay. no I, Let the I record not. show. Yes. Let the record show, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, one more thing. She asked one more, and I'll, I'll ask. I'll answer this because this is something I've been asked before. Uh, there's a scene where somebody says, "What's your name, soldier?" And I say, "Maxwell, sir." This village is wasteful, soldier. Yes, sir. You're losing half your applesauce. Apples don't grow on trees, you know. <laughs> no, sir. What's your name, fella? Maxwell, sir. Well, you're going on KP, Maxwell. I am on KP, sir. Well, the minute you come off, you're going on. And, of course, that's my name, actually. Mm -hmm. And they kind of said, oh, gosh, did you forget and just say your name <laughs> instead of saying Straminsky or some other thing? And I said, the, the reality is, no, I didn't forget. They wrote it that way. So in the early days, somebody wrote in Maxwell, uh, and then later on, they started giving me the name uh, Straminsky. So that Straminsky came later. But the first time that, uh, you know, they wanted me to say my last name, uh, it was Maxwell. So nobody screwed up. Uh, it was written that way. <laughs> I've always wondered that as well. But, you know, there was a there's a theory out there and I can't remember where I heard it. But there is a theory out there that that maybe Maxwell was Igor's real first name. That's a fan theory that's uh, circling out there on the interwebs I wanted you to be aware of. Is this the dark interwebs, or what kind of thing is that? I don't know what that means. That, what, Igor, Maxwell Igor, what? Maxwell, I'm confused. Yes, that your name is actually Maxwell Straminsky, and your nickname was Igor. So when, when Frank Burns asks, Igor, what's your name? He replied with his first name, Maxwell. Again, I'm not saying that it's right. Obviously, it's not. But that is a fan theory that I have heard. No, that's not true. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care what the fan theory is. <laughs> they can come over to my house right now, and I will show them why. Well, I can't show them why. I don't have my pants on. Right. <laughs> but it's not true. No, it was my name. They wrote it in, and I said the words. Otherwise, I would have been fired and dragged out and thrown in the street. So you have to say every word that's in that script, and that's what I did diligently and responsibly. Do you have the names and numbers of those fan people? I gotta call them. They, I they're, don't. They're no. not right in the head or but something. But it's canon now. It's out there. You have set the record straight. I've set the record straight. No more of this uh, dark fandom theory stuff. No, no, no. You can't do that. You have to. If you have that sort of problem, write in. Uh, or leave a message and, and we'll get back to you. Sometime. You know, there's things like fan fiction out there. There's like mash fan fiction. I have not read any of it, but I can only imagine that, that Igor has somebody out there at some point has written some Igor Straminsky fan fiction. Maybe we'll have to get our hands on some of that. I have a, uh, I was communicating for a while with a fellow, uh, who is making documentaries in Australia. And he's also a big MASH fan. And he actually wrote an episode that was sort of totally featured around Igor. And I was thrilled that he did it. Somebody during the 11 years of the show should have done it, but <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. I'm all right. You're not bitter. I'm not bitter. Uh, but he wrote the, the thing and it was really kind of good. You know, I was really surprised. He kind of captured the character of Igor and everybody else. I was kind of impressed. So that, that happens. So anybody wants to do that, that's fine. And yes, if you know anybody at CBS who isn't fired or, <laughs> well, you know, the thing nowadays is to re revive all these old shows. So I think maybe Igor could have his own show, you know, come back and, yeah. and, and do a revival. No, they're going to revive it and put it in Alaska and call it mush. But anyway. <laughs> We'll be right back.
Uh, hey, and two quick comments. One from Travis Cook, who's actually a, a friend of mine, but he emailed in and said, Hey, Jeff and Ryan, just subscribe to the podcast. Listen to the pilot episode. I used to watch MASH at my grandparents' house when I was a kid. Never really considered myself a fan, but I did enjoy it from time to time. Have to say, I would consider myself a fan of the podcast, though. Hey, whoa, says the chemistry between you guys is neat to hear. Both very funny, very entertaining people with fascinating perspectives on what MASH was and why it became such a phenomenon. Can't wait to hear more. A MASH Matters fan. That's from my friend Travis. And and just so you know, Jeff, I did not pay him to say that. Why not? I mean, that's pretty good. Well, I'm going to pay him now. Oh, yeah. You're going yes, to pay I'm going to put him on a hefty payment plan now. But uh, That's very sweet. No, I, we really appreciate that. That's very, very nice. It is very difficult to know. You know, when you do a television show, you can see the show 11 weeks later and people will laugh and you can kind of get it because you're watching it and with other people and you see whether it's any good or not. You know, Ryan and I are sitting, you know, well, I have no pants on. Ryan could have some on. I don't know. I have shorts on. Okay. We don't know, you know, what's really going on. So we're kind of in a, in an isolated situation. So hearing that kind of response is really helpful and really appreciated. I personally appreciate it very, very much. And I'm, I'm sure you do as well. I do. And another comment from Jason Snyder, who uh, another person who I know, and I'm also going to have to start paying. Uh, he says, MASH was something my dad and I would watch as I was growing up. We tried to tape every episode on VCR tapes, and to this day, we still have those VCR tapes. Uh, now I own all the seasons on DVD and still watch them on a regular basis. MASH was, in my opinion, a show that you could connect with more than just one character. I know people like Hawkeye, BJ, Winchester, Klinger, and yes, even Igor. I am looking forward to hearing many more podcasts. So thank you, Jason. Uh, we're looking forward to bringing you many more podcasts as well. I think that's going to be the title of my next book. Even Igor. <laughs> I like that. I have to do, I have to answer one more question here because this has been asked before and I want to clear the air. I mean, this is episode two. Let's clear the air. Let's let everybody know we are telling the truth and clearing the air. The question is, was Wayne Rogers a diva, as rumor has it? No. Okay. <laughs> okay. No, Wayne Rogers was not. There wasn't a diva on the set of MASH. And it's also been reported kind of that Gary Berghoff might have been difficult or a diva. Yes. Absolutely. Positively not. Nobody was a diva. Everybody at one time or another could say, hey, well, gosh, what about this? And gee, I'm feeling a little like that. And as I said, you don't go through a family, uh, an 11 years worth of a family and not have disagreements or problems or conflicts. So it's natural to have people disagreeing with other people and disagreeing about, a, uh, you know, a, a direction of something. But by no stretch of the imagination was anybody a diva. These were all very highly intelligent, very sort of, um, I don't want to say developed, but sort of developed emotionally folks. Uh, there wasn't kind of a, a kid, child, goofball in the bunch. As I say, not without problems, not without disagreements, mm -hmm. but nothing that wasn't uh, solvable and unreasonable in terms of what was happening at the time. So, no, he wasn't a diva. Nobody was a diva. That kind of disappoints some people because I think it's kind of fun to say, oh, well, see what he, oh, oh, he was a jerk. Oh, he was an idiot. <laughs> Ain't true. Never happened. Didn't work that way. So, and as a matter of fact, what what was fun about Wayne Rogers, he, he was a great financial genius. And so he would shoot a scene and then walk over to the telephone and be on the phone saying, buy, sell, buy, sell, buy, sell. <laughs> and I would hang around listening and, you know, gee, what is he buying and selling? I want to know. Uh, so he was very helpful to a lot of people in terms of their own finances. He actually represented a bunch of actors and helped them, you know, develop themselves financially. So he wasn't a diva, great guy. He left the show for, for reasons that I think were valid for him as an actor. He felt that the, uh, the character just wasn't being developed, um, in the way that he felt it, it might be and could have been. 
But that didn't create any bad blood between anybody. Nobody likes to lose an actor like him, but nobody hated him. He didn't hate anybody. It was just kind of a, a, an adult decision that he had to work through and struggle with. But he did it, and he did it fairly and honestly and, and sincerely, and nobody hated him. So, no, good guy. Well, thank you, Nicole and Russ, for submitting that question to us. And, uh, you know, you say that he wasn't a diva and no, nobody was a diva. You know, there's that, that old saying about poker that if you're sitting at a poker table and you don't see the sucker, then it's you. Um, so I'm just saying, could it be possible that since you're saying that nobody was a diva, could it be possible that you, Jeff Maxwell, were the diva of the mash set? Thanks very much for listening, everybody. And next week, we're going to be talking in more detail about how to wear your underwear when you're doing your podcast. And writing your segue. Uh Should we stream that? Maybe we stream that. What is that? You can do it on your phone and you stream yourself. Oh, yes. We can stream. We can streak. You can streak while you're streaming, I guess. You know, I'd like to bring up the fact also that this is an amazing technological uh, wonder that we're doing this podcast. And it just to me, maybe to somebody else, to an 11 year old, it's not. To me, it is. Because the knowledge is, and the truth is, that you, Ryan, are in Illinois, mm-hmm. and I, Jeff, am in California. And we are talking to each other just like we're sitting next to each other. Is that not amazing or what? It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. It yeah. It's pretty cool. And and I owe it to your great technical expertise and your brilliant uh, putting together of this amazing technology and being able to bring it uh, to everybody. And because I wouldn't have known what the heck to do or how to do it. So I thank you, Ryan, for doing that. And as I say, for doing the heavy lifting to get this thing up and running. Uh, This was all Ryan's idea in the first place. And I just hogged in on it as best I could, uh, because that's basically what I all I know how to do. So, <laughs> but it's, uh, and you do it well. You really do it well. Really, no, yeah. I, thanks. Thank you. Again, I am thrilled that you're a part of this. So, thank well, you so much, uh, Jeff. And for- I'm thrilled that you're a part of this because I would not have done this with anybody else other than you. Um, people have said, "Oh, let's do this, this, and that," and I and I have not. And but I wouldn't have done it with anybody else other than you because you not only have a tremendous radio background in history, so you know what you're doing in front of a microphone. But you're a really cool guy, and you're also an actor. And I think sometime we ought to talk about that, because you're a very accomplished actor with a long list of wonderful plays that you've been in. And uh, that also is something that I responded to, because I think we can relate to each other uh, on that level as well. And and not only friends, but kind of uh, with a history of that kind of a, uh, you know background. So... Congratulations to you uh, for putting all this together, and congratulations for me just for just getting out of bed and showing up. I'm, see okay. now, now I've got to put you on a payment plan as well. This is getting very expensive. Yeah, it's gonna be. Yeah, well. Yeah. Hey, if you have questions, we want to hear from you. Go to mashmatterspodcast.com, email us through the website, or call and leave a voicemail five one three four three six four zero seven seven. We're on Twitter, at Mash Matters, and if you're on Apple Podcasts, the iTunes thing, please subscribe and leave a five-star review. We do have more questions and comments that have come in, and we will get to those in future episodes, so please keep them coming in. And here's the other thing. People have asked me, how often are we going to be putting out episodes? Hey, Ryan. Yes, Jeff. How often are we going to be putting out episodes, do you think? Just uh, just off the top of your head. Hands waving in the air. What do you think? Great question. The answer is we are going to uh, hopefully put out episodes the first and 15th of every month. So that's our plan, at least. That sounds reasonable. Yeah, I think so. So I think we can handle that. That means you have to talk to me every other week, which is uh, uh, about what my wife does. So it works out. (laughs) (laughs) We're here all week, ladies and gentlemen. Have the veal. All right. So until next time, uh, please. So is that it? We're not going to talk anymore. That's the. No, that's, that's it. We're done. I'll put my pants back on and go somewhere. <laughs> well, yeah, in that order, please. Yeah. <laughs> as always, uh, Mr. Patrick, a pleasure. And as always, Mr. Maxwell, the very same. Thank you all for listening, and hope you continue to do it. Mm-hmm.